so what affects this event causes? Okay, so for me, so unless you have that, then then uh, science is very difficult to perform. Um, then the second question that I have for you is, how many of you think that Maxwell's equations are causal? So Maxwell's equations are are uh, uh, essential for understanding uh, everything from uh, like our, our everyday. Let's say electromagnetism. Uh, so electric, magnetic effects, lights, radiation. So how many of you think that Maxwell equations are causal? And I would say, I thought that Maxwell equations were causal. <laughs> okay, so there are not so many hands. So uh, actually, Maxwell equations are not causal, okay? And this for me, when I learned that, let's say uh, uh, six, seven years ago, it was like a big shock, uh, it was like, Okay, so this is impossible. I mean, so Maxwell equations are like my bread and butter. I mean, so <laughs> unless they are causal, I, I cannot understand what, what's happening. So I will explain you in three slides very briefly, and I don't want to go into the details why this happens. So Maxwell equations usually relate some sources, which we describe in terms of currents, uh, let's say J and, 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 uh, and electric uh, densities. And what Maxwell equations do is if you take these sources, Okay, so then Maxwell equations transform that into electric and magnetic fields that you can visible measure. Okay, so this is what basically Maxwell equations do. Then we have another thing which Maxwell equations give you, which is the opposite. Okay, so from electric and magnetic fields and the Lorentz force, you can see what happens with your, uh, let's say, charges or, or, or currents, okay? So what, how they change, what are the equations of motions of, the, of these things? So one would think that self-consistent theory uh, will take these two paths and give you something which is completely self-consistent, okay? So your charges and sources, they change your electric and magnetic fields, and these may change the, the currents and, and uh, charges, and then, well, you have some kind of equations of motion, which, well, they would be self-consistent. The problem with this is that you have an effect, which is called radiation reaction. Okay. And this happens because actually the radiation of one charge can affect the own charge, the same charge, okay? Um, and it happens that this effect is not constant. So when you put this all together, you have equations of motion, which actually are not second order in the in, in, in the position. So they are not they, the forces, they don't, don't depend on acceleration, but they depend on the third derivative of the position. And this causes very nasty uh, solutions. In particular, uh, the particles can move indefinitely. So they 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 don't need any, they, they can self-accelerate. Uh, and the other, there are other solutions where what happens is that actually the particle, so you have, you, you send some kind of pulse or something to a particle uh, and, the, and the particle starts moving before, before even the, 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 the radiation arrives to the particle. So this is a null problem. Uh, I think that, so if you take the, the, the equations, this happens at very small scale, very, very small scale. So this is embedded in Maxwell equations. There's, there's, I mean, there has been many people trying to, to uh, uh, solve this. Like, so how do you name it? Uh, this is Binger, Dirac, uh, Lorentz, uh, Einstein, Feynman. They all dealt with this problem. And they didn't find a solution. Uh, the only thing is that it's true that it, this basically happens at very, very small scales. So as may, as case so small that it's, I mean, so it happens with, in, within the, what's called the classical radius of the electron, which is, I mean, uh, well, uh, uh, a quantity that you can get from Maxwell equations. <laughs> so it's 10 to the minus 15 meters. So just to give you an, uh, another effect, which could be considerable. So it's the Compton effect, which is, which is like the, the, the limit when uh, classical Maxwell equations just start, start failing and you need to use quantum, quantum uh, mechanics. So this happens on 10 to the <laughs> minus, 13, 10 to the minus 12, okay? So it's, this is three orders of magnitude less than that. Um, 
one would think that then that you have to use quantum electrodynamics to solve it, but actually it's not true. Quantum electrodynamics doesn't give you a solution for this. Uh, so it seems that the only possible solution in order to avoid this from a theoretical perspective is to set a time scale in Maxwell's equations, which actually they don't have. Maxwell equations, they don't have any time scale or length scale for that matter. Ah. Wait. <laughs> so someone doesn't like this. Uh, <laughs> And I don't like it either, so that's that's fine. Uh, okay, so this is this is what it is, and it's been 150 years or 120 years since these problems starts started arising, and we haven't found a solution. And truly, what happens is that probably with these kind of problems that we don't find a solution for so many years, usually they are lost and they are forgotten, and we keep dealing with with things as they are, basically because there is no. Uh, experimental way of measuring this. Why is that? Because I mean, for example, if you have this kind of time scale, which is 10 to the minus 23, and you use the frequency of light, which is 10 to the 15, this happens at 10 to the minus eight, okay? Uh, so in order to measure, for example, how this could affect the Larmor frequency, so I mean, this is this is how, so the rotation, so the, the, the frequency of, 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 uh, of a charge which is rotating, so you should measure that in date significant digit, which is a real experimental problem, okay? So no one has been able to measure this. Uh, so these kind of uh, non-causal relations or, or these kind of runaway solutions, because I mean, these are so slow that, that actually this is called micro-causality, okay? It's, it's Maxwell's, Maxwell's equations are, uh, are equations which are causal for microscopic uh, things, but they are not causal for microscopic. So this is my, so this is a problem which is called micro causality. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, so no treatment to date has been able to to measure. Oh. What we would, I mean, if I would like to attack this problem, which is uh, from uh, in, in my small lab, what I would need. Okay, so I would need a wish list, which I put here, like I would like to have rotating particles, uh, basically highly so with high speed, uh, in order to measure these things. I would like to have quantum emitters so that emit light when they are rotating. Uh, I would need to develop some new interferometric techniques in order to measure that because I, I mean the, the the scales that I have to measure are so small that, that it's almost I mean so the, the current temperature has to reach there. And yeah, so we, I will need to control the electromagnetic fields on the nano and the micro scales. Okay, so this is at least what I would like to do. And actually. Um, the question is, so I mean, you have to push the technologies to, 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 to such a limit to measure these things, and uh, is it worth it? Okay, I mean, so yeah, we're exploring exotic, uh, exotic theories, and, and actually these kind of systems, or, so if you had all the, all that wish list, actually you could also measure for example, dark matter or dark energy to the, in, the, in, 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 uh, in a tabletop experiment. Uh, there would be things that could be interesting, like, uh, um, Mixing uh, general relativity, like non-inertial frames, with quantum meters, which is also an open problem in the in the current science. Um, you can find some some of these things in this, in this. But maybe I mean, so it's like a very long-term uh, uh, thing, no? That you you would like to do. But in the meantime, if we have all these, we are developing new quantum metrology schemes, which can be used for other things. Uh, we can actually, I will show you that, so if in, in this kind of long path, uh, we are also developing new classification algorithms. Uh, we can use many of these things to, for quantum communications. We could improve <laughs> magnetic sensors uh, at room temperature. Uh, some of the techniques that I'm going to show you are uh, useful, for, useful for improving NMR techniques. <laughs> Meter the microphone or something? I don't think it's me. I think it's I, I, I will. It's that. So I think that's that's okay. So yes. Um. Then we'll have also quantum enhanced inertial sensors. I mean, there's there's a bunch of of things, okay, that that you can do in the path to this like like very distant goal. Um, I'm not saying that. That we are going to be able to attack these problems. Okay, they are very hard. Uh, but I think that uh, in the lab that we have in, uh, across the street, we have a chance of going of, of going there. So we have a chance of going to these kind of regimes of, of very sensitive measurements. And even if we don't get there, there's going to be a lot of exciting things that we, we will discover in the process. Okay. 
So the idea of this talk, besides this kind of uh, motivation, which um, as I told you, maybe it's not so related with what I'm going to show you. It's more like a wish list of what we would like to do in 10 or 15 years. Uh, but I'm going to cover a broad range of topics. And I thought that this kind of uh, uh, motivation would show you why we are doing this kind of broad range of topics. Because I'm going to show you things which are quantum optics, entangled photons, uh, non-classical light. I'm going to show you also um, uh, uh, how we con can control the electric and, and, and the nuclear spins of nitrogen vacancy centers in diamonds. And I'm going to show you what we are doing in optical forces and uh, trapping and levitation. And why we are covering all these topics is because we want to integrate them in a single platform where we can attack these kind of difficult problems. Okay, so we want to, to try to explore new physics and in the, in the way uh, we want to develop new sensors and new um, way, ways of measuring things. Okay, so I'll start with, with this part here, which is probably the one that how we started our lab. Uh, th this is a picture of our lab probably five years ago. I'm going to show you a, a new one. And in the, in the lab, I mean, so we have, well, you should come actually and, uh, and see it yourselves, for yourselves. Uh, but we have two optical tables and here basically it's where we do all the, all the quantum, let's say photonics. Uh, we have a, a setup for classical photonics as well, like classical scattering experiments. And here we are doing a bunch of things. Uh, like, uh, so we, we use the diamonds in this part here. Well, actually in this picture, we didn't have it. And here we, we have the optical levitation and, and, and trapping. There's a thing that I haven't mentioned, and it's that we also collaborate, and I'm, going to, I'm not going to mention this at all. So we also have a program where we are developing new uh, fluorescence microscopes. Uh, and this is uh, in collaboration with Juanjo Gomez Cadenas, uh, because this is a part of a bigger experience where they want to measure things with neutrinos. And probably you've heard a lot of that in other talks, so that I'm not going to cover that. Um, this is a, a new picture, so actually it was this morning. Uh, of the lab. And you see that there's more stuff. We have safety uh, in the lab. Uh, and uh, we have new lasers and, and uh, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's fuller, I would say. Um, and this is the team, okay? Uh, this is a picture of this, of this year. Uh, I mean, most of the, of the guys here are going to appear somehow in the, in the talk, maybe not in name, but all of them are, are working hard in order to pursue all, all these things. Um, the interesting thing of this photo, I like it, is because, I mean, if you've seen other talks of me, um, you've seen that I like comics. And uh, actually, this, this photo reminds me of this one, <laughs> <laughs> where you can see that, I mean, this guy is a Green Lantern, and you can see that we have a, <laughs> a Green Lantern here. Okay. Anyway, so let's start with quantum optics. Okay, so this, is, this, is, this was the bread and butter of our lab for uh, the beginning, the, some years. And this is what I, I mean, the techniques that I learned in, in Vienna when I was there. This is an, an entangled photon source. Uh, this is pumped by, by this laser. And actually, again, this photo is sold and the, the setup is, is much advanced now. Uh, but well, so you can see a little bit the path of the, of the, of the pump light and here are produced the, the entangled photons and they go here, one goes here, the other goes here, and then they are, they are measured. Okay, um, because I'm going to cover a lot of topics. I'm not going to go into almost any details of what are entangled photons or, so I want to show you what are the techniques that we can use and why. And if you have questions, just please ask me later. And also, if you have any questions in the meantime, you can stop me at any point. Okay, so, so in the lab, we produce this, this kind of, uh, so these entangled photons, which are twin photons. And I'll show you, I mean, a small video where, how, so, how they are produced. Um, but the nice thing of this, this kind of system is that, I mean, they are quantum correlated. They can propagate, we can, we can send them in through optical fibers to distant parts. Uh, and also we can control the quantum state through many different degrees of field. So we have full control of, of entangled photons in our lab. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to show you is, is uh, how they are producing that small crystal that I showed you in the, in the photo. Let's see if this works. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So this is the laser that I showed you. This is a blue laser, okay? Uh, and then uh, this emits lots of photons. And uh, it's working. Oh yeah, 
So, and then when they go through, so this is just a small number of photons, but imagine that there are many more. And uh, actually with a low efficiency, some of them are, are converted in the, in the crystal that I also pointed in the, in, in the, in the picture. This is a nonlinear crystal, which actually from time to time just converts one of these blue photons into two in the infrared, okay? And when they are produced, they are produced at the same time, uh, which allows, them, allows us to measure them uh, with these single photon detectors. What happens is that just because, because they are produced at the same time, we can discriminate these photons from noise in uh, elsewhere, because we, what we do is measure them in coincidence, okay? Whenever the two photons may click in the two detectors, then we know that they have been produced uh, in the crystal. Uh, and they, I mean, then we can measure all these quantum correlations with, with high accuracy, okay? So this is the basic idea. And why is, are they important for, for our purposes? Okay, so actually, quantum metrology is based on, on an effect which is called quantum interference, okay? So quantum interference happens, for example, when you have two particles, let's say two photons, which arrive to, let's say, a beam splitter. Uh, and then from all the four options that you typically have, which is, which is that the two go on one side, the two go on, on the other, or one goes on, on one direction, the other, and the other, okay? So these possibilities are canceled by quantum interference, okay? So what happens is that this possibility has an opposite sign that this other possibility, and then they cancel, and then you always have that. If and only if they are indistinguishable particles or they are intact, basically there's a, there's a relation between them. So what happens when we have this? It happens that then we can use this kind of effects to do measurements with, a, a, let's say, uh, a better sensitivity. So this, is, so if this is the noise on your measurements, and this is, let's say, the number of resources. Imagine that this controls the number of photons that you can use in your measurement. What happens is that, um, again, uh, uh, sticking like broadly, your noise scales with one over the square root of n. Okay. If you can use this kind of resources, like quantum states, you can reach something which is one over n. Okay. So with the same number of resources, then you can improve your measurement. And this is important in, in places where the number of resources, and I quote, I put resources in quote because it can be many things, um, but you can imagine them M being the number of photons. So when you have a limited number of, of resources, let's say, for example, because they, they produce some back action in your system or they hit your system or they can destroy your sample. So in these situations, then using entangled photons is better. Okay. One example is in the LIGO. So in, in, in LIGO, they, they need to use quantum uh, so the detection of, of radiational uh, waves. They are now in the next system, they are using uh, a, a system which is called a quantum, uh, a quantum squeezed system in order to, to do the measurement, the interferometric measurements of, of, the, of the mirrors. Uh, I don't want you to, to understand this picture at all. I just want to show you that we have a, a, a really good control of our system now. So this, this picture was taken by, by Miguel Varga. And this blue stuff would be the quantum, where the quantum interference is done. We change the temperature of the crystal and it's also the, the, the distance between the photons. Um, I, so I just wanted to show you this because it shows, so this is experimental and this is uh, calculated, this is analytical. Okay, so we have a really good control of our system and we understand our system very well. Um, and what do we want to do with it? Okay, so this is the other part of the lab that I showed you. This is this is the setup where we do uh, let's say classical scattering experiments. So what we want to do is so here this is a, an optically addressable cryostat. We can go to four Kelvin in this system and we can place samples there and move them with anometric precision. And uh, so with a system of, of microscope objectives, so we can so we have a, a tunable source of light. And we can control so the wavelength of, of, of this classical source. We can control also the polarization, and we can control the spatial shape. And with all that, we can do some kind of non-trivial scattering experiments with our samples. Okay? And what we want to do is compare this kind of classical experiment with our quantum source and see where which kind of applications we can do with, with our system. Uh, this is a good point to show you one thing that we do with our light. And this is going to have this is going to appear in other parts of the talk. Uh, so that's we can control the angular momentum of light. Okay? So this is done with this system here. This is a, it's called a spatial light modulator, and this can change the shape of, of, of the light. Okay, so these are experimental pictures. 
So this is uh, the typical Gaussian beam. But whenever we impart a phase in our SLM, which goes from zero to two pi going around, then we can create this kind of, of donut beams, okay? And uh, in these donut beams, also the, the phase of, of light goes around and it, it increases with this L. So here you, you go one turn, here you go two turns, okay? Uh, three, four, and so on. Okay? So we can, uh, we can control this kind of twisting of the phase of the light around and creating these, these donut beams, which actually they carry angular momentum and they can pass this angular momentum to particles. Okay, so this is something which is important for, for the things that we do. Uh, and one thing that, that we can do with ki this kind of playing with the polarization and we have, with the angular momentum is, is, uh, some, is test uh, nanoholes. So this, this, so this is an experiment where we create angle photons here and we make them pass through a small nanohole was like uh, 800 nanometers of diameter. So it's of the order of the wavelength. And what we want to test is that uh, we could create entangled photons and see what happened when they went through, through the nanohole. Okay. So this was published uh, some years ago and appeared in, in, uh, uh, in, in some media. Uh, and again, I don't want to go into, uh, I don't want you to understand the details. I, I just want to, to get you with the idea that we could measure the entanglement of these photons going through the nanohole. Actually, we created two different kinds of entanglement. Uh, so this is two photons of one kind minus two photons of, of the other kind, and this is with a plus, okay? So these were the measurements before going through the nanohole. And well, so the, the idea would be that, so we, we should just have these four pillars. Uh, these go down because of this minus sign. These go up because of this plus sign. Uh, and if you see all the rest, like these two things or or or, or that is its minus. Okay, this, this is this. Is what are, are R and R L. What 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 are they? This is the the right circular polarization and left circular polarization. They are uh, so they they represent the felicity of, of of the photons. Okay, so in principle you should have two photons with right circular polarization or two photons with left circular polarization. And what we are changing is the phase, the quantum phase between these two possibilities. Okay, this is what we do in this, this experiment. Uh, the other thing that it's it's a technical is that actually this zero is the total angular momentum. So actually when they have right circular polarization, the phase goes on the opposite direction. Okay, so this is, it's, it's just technical. I don't, I, I mean, so, if you have any more questions, just please ask me later. Okay, and this is what happens after, okay? So this is before going through the nanohole. This is what happens after going through the nanohole. And you can see that this phase, which, I mean, in principle, it's a quantum phase, has a very strong uh, change in the photons after going through the nanohole, okay? So one of the systems is basically unaffected. There's more noise, of course, because there are fewer photons. There's, there's lots of losses. Um, but you still have these two big pillars, and you can still distinguish the, the minus. Uh, so this is the, the correlation, the, the cross correlation uh, um, dependence, while for the other one, it's completely destroyed. Okay, so you don't have any more coherence. Uh, these two pillars increase a lot. Um, it's it's striking how this quantum phase can completely change your state after going through the now. And of course, you can do some measurements of the entanglement of the relations and all that. And yeah, so actually, for for one of them, um, basically, uh, the, the system is completely lost. While for the other, you keep the entanglement and other measures. Okay, so besides that, what we are doing is using these entangled photons for quantum communications. We want to test them in multimode fibers. We want to see how entanglement, how robust this entanglement when they, it propagates to multimode fibers. Um, and also we are working uh, in these uh, crazy experiments where we are using, we take one of those photons, uh, we make them go through a lot of, of, uh, uh, of quarter wave plates and half wave plates. But the idea is that each one of these quarter and half wave plates can be controlled independently. And actually what we do is, is do, a, let's say a, a machine learning algorithm where uh, in the end, each one of these systems can be, so it, it keeps changing until finding 
a, a, a position where you can classify different uh, polarizations when they are. Okay, so this is a collaboration with, with multiverse computing. Uh, and, uh, and well, so it's, it's starting to give results. Okay, so what else do we want to do with all this system? Okay, so we want to move to more photons. And actually, we are developing, Maria here is, is, is developing a, a quantum squeeze light source, which would mean more photons and, more, and a better ability to, to like, find measurements. We want to hyper entangle our photons. We, we want to entangle them in all the possible degrees of freedom that we can control. And yeah, so this is the thing that we are going through. So we want to compare the different regimes, the classical and the quantum, and see where do we have a uh, some some uh, uh, improvements. We want to so, so we are with that. So we want to use different materials, temperature, pressure, because we have all that in our lab, and we can do that. And of course, at some point, we would like to test with these systems what happens with levitated particles. Okay. And this is done with. I mean, we have a, a linear strategic project with Tecno, with multiverse computing, and also under Cartec with with some companies which are interested in these things. Uh, yeah. Uh, Okay, so the second part of the talk, uh, the third, <laughs> would go on, on this quantum sensing with, with diamonds, okay? So this is what I told you in the beginning. So this is again, so like a, some snapshots, this was this is an old picture, this, uh, this is much newer. Our, our diamond is here, uh, and this is the, all the lasers and control of, of, of the diamond. Uh, and yeah, so we are using a confocal, uh, confocal microscope, which goes from below uh, here, you can see. So we put the microscope to keep here, and then we can move our system uh, with uh, some accuracy. Okay, so why diamonds? And why, why, what, what do, do we want to achieve with this? Okay, so diamond usually is transparent. Uh, so when, so the pure diamond is a, is a carbon matrix and it's transparent. But so the colors that you see in some diamonds come because they have defects, okay? So if defects means that, for example, one of the carbon atoms disappears and it's replaced by, in this case, a nitrogen atom, okay? And this kind of system creates a nitrogen, so you have a nitrogen atom and a vacancy, so it's some place where you have carbon. <coughs> and actually what happens is that electrons are trapped in this, in this, this kind of gap, in this kind of system. This is, this is called a nitrogen vacancy, vacancy defect. And so this is one of the effects that give color to, to diamond. The thing is that this kind of trap, uh, it's, it's for, for the electrons feels like, a, like an artificial atom, which is in, in a solid state. So it, you, you can find it there. And actually you can control many properties of the, of the electrons at room temperature. Okay? So, so uh, in principle, for example, we can we can control so we can we can see the we can see the energy levels and we can control the spin uh, of the electrons with with microwave uh, waves. Uh, this is this is an example of what happens here. Okay, so this is this is a, a, a sketch of the energy levels there. So you have a ground state for the for your electrons, and then you have a, a excited state. And what happens is that so. You can you can see also like three levels. The zero, one, and minus one would would represent the, the spin of the of the electronic system. Okay. So what happens is that if you pump, let's say with green light, then the system is de-excited in and, and this gives you red light. Which so if the state was here, then it comes back to the same place, and if it was here, it comes back to the same place. Except that from time to time, when the electrons are in this, let's say state, one or minus one, what happens is that when it's excited with the green light, part of the state goes to a, a metastable state, uh, and then it doesn't radiate, okay? So this means that if, the, if your photon is here, so if your electrons are, are here, you have lots of red light, and when they are here, you have less red light, okay? So the fluorescence changes uh, depending on the spin of the electrons. So and of course, these states, okay, are separated by magnetic fields because they are spin states. So what you can see here is what happens if uh, you change the magnetic field and you convert the state of your electron from here to here with a microwave uh, source. Okay. So what you are doing is you are measuring the fluorescence. You keep pumping in the green, and you can you see what happens in the with the fluorescence. And when you hit, let's say, this microwave field, which is coupled to 
it's a state, for example, then your fluorescence decreases a little bit. And then you know that actually you're measuring that your photon, your electron was in this state. Uh, the separation between these two would be the separation of these two, and this allows you to measure magnetic field with, with greater powers. Okay. One interesting thing is that actually uh, this is just controlling the electric, uh, the, the electronic spin state, but also you can transfer the spin state to, to surrounding you know, nuclei. So there's a coupling between them that you can control. Um, so why can be this interesting besides controlling uh, what are these quantum states at the at room temperature? Is because actually you can measure magnetic fields very very precisely. Um, of course, you can use these systems as, as single photon emitters. Uh, so you can pump your a single MB and then see the photons that are coming from there and control that with a spin. Uh, and because you can transfer transfer that spin electronic state to surrounding nuclei, maybe you can improve nuclear magnetic resonance techniques or even. You know. Okay, so the idea of this transfer is exactly that. Okay, so you have some electronic spin, but also you have some nuclear spins and they have some, some coupling between them. And uh, uh, you can, because the, the, the energies of the different nuclear, of the different spins are very different then you can control them independently. That's really well. you, could, you should see some kind of hyperfine uh, splitting of, 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 the, uh, of the resonances that I showed you before, okay? Uh, so this is our system. Uh, this is the antenna that we have developed here in order to 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 send the microwave fields to the to the diamond. Uh, the diamond is placed here. This is from one millimeter times one millimeter, mm -hmm. and this has been developed by Ruben, uh, who is a postdoc working with us. Um, and this is the whole system. So I showed you another picture from from the side. This is this is from above, and these are the some results that we already are already getting. So this is when we use because we can control the the, uh, the polarization of the microwave field. Actually, what I can show you is that well, so uh, when we change the the microwave the frequency of the microwave field, uh, then there are these these two uh, resonances that that appear, um, and the distance between them is what it's giving you basically what is the magnetic field which is being sampled by the system. So also we can, we can, we can change the polarization of the microwave field. And when, I mean, when we use the polarization, then one of the, one of the uh, two uh, resonances is greatly attenuated. Which is, yeah. Yeah. Also we can, we can do, we can control our system. We know that we can control system because we're measuring the radio oscillations, okay? So this, uh, in a nutshell, what we are doing is, is changing the, the length of the, of the microwave pulse that we are sending. And it, that, that means that we can actually not only change completely the population from zero to one or zero to minus one, but also we can go midway and create superposition states between spin zero and spin. Okay, so this is what it's telling, telling you this. And uh, this kind of decay, it's also telling, you, telling us what is the decoherence of our system. This is just to show you that we are at this point able to control the spin state of our enemies. Okay, so <laughs> this is the, the take home message. Okay, um, but just take a look at, at, at uh, actually this picture here. Okay, you can see that actually there's, there's a structure in one of the peaks. Okay, and this structure is given by the surrounding nuclei. So this is a, the hyperfine splitting of, of this. So what this means is that we are also uh, in a position where we are starting to be able to control the, the spin of the surrounding nuclei. Okay, so this is this is where we want to go. Okay, so what needs to be done? Well, the, one of the things that I didn't show you, didn't tell you is that actually this is for big samples. So we have lots of MBs in those samples. Uh, and uh, well, so this, this, this is a limitation and an advantage for some things. But what we want to do is go to a regime where we can also isolate single MBs and this would be controlled a single electron, well, a single electronic system or a single uh, nuclei. Um, we want to use that hyperfine splitting in order to control the surrounding nuclei, and in order to for those all those applications in NMR and MRI, what what we we want to do is is um, fabricate some microfluidic channels on the on the diamond in order to put place there our samples and be able to measure 
uh, the the species that we are the, the, that we are sending through coupling to the to the MB, uh, MB nuclear. Also, this this is within this Cartec project, and actually Technalia is is helping us uh, Technicer. This should be Technicer and AVS, the air companies which are so working in, in that direction. And we have a collaboration with with um, the Technical University in Holland. So I'm um, how how much time do I have? Yes. Okay. So this is the last part of the talk, as I as I told you in the beginning. Um, and what the third part we then I'm going to talk is about optical trapping and, and our levitation system. Again, this is a this is a probably an old picture of our system. This is where our optical trapping is, and I will show you. I'm not going to go into details now, uh, but uh, I will show you in more detail in, in, in a second. Uh, what, what's that? And this is our vacuum chamber where we are also developing our levitation system. So the idea is to transfer the optical trapping experiments from here to our uh, vacuum chamber and then have, so instead of, of holding uh, our particles in water with light, what we want to do, do is hold them in vacuum. Okay, and this will give us some advantages as, as I will show you. Okay, so what is optical trap? Okay, so um, the idea is to use a beam of light, focus it very tightly. And what happens is that in the, the focus, the particle is, is trapped. Okay, so actually particles, small particles typically go to, to, to the to where the bright light is. Okay, uh, this is, for example, a, a, an image of. Uh, of, of, of how the samples look in the microscope. And then I'm going to show you this small video where you can see what happens when we shine light through this kind of sample. This, this video was done by Iker a few years ago already. Uh, so safety first in our lab. So, and then, he can switch on the laser, and you will see how all these small uh, spheres, which are in water, plop, then when you switch the laser, they go to the sun. Okay? It's very striking how they are attracted by light. Okay, this is spheres, uh, in sil uh, silica spheres in water, and they tend to go to the to the brightest part of, of, of our beam. Okay. Um, uh, one of the things that we can do besides besides uh, measuring the the, uh, the the image of the particles is actually accurately measure their position. Okay. So this is done by this system. This is a quadrant photodiode, and what it does is it, it takes the the scattered light by the particles, and it sends it four different detectors in four different positions. And what we measure is the small differences between one detector and another. Okay. Um, and this, so if the particle moves to a little bit to the right, then the right detector is brighter, so it sees more light. If it goes a little bit up, then you see that the up, uh, so the, the the upper detector just gets more light. Okay. So this is this is the basic idea. And then we can analyze that data. We do a Fourier transform of all the, all all those um, differences between the detectors. And then when we plot it, actually, we see that actually we have a corner frequency. And this is what this means is that we you are in a in a damp regime. Okay, so your particle is moving because of the light, because it's trapped, but it's also it's also moving because it's being hit by all the water molecules. And also you have dissipation. Okay, so your particle should be trapped there and it's moving, and then um, this basically it's telling you uh, what is what is the the how how much force you are holding onto the particle? So the more this moves to the right, that means the more uh, trapped you have. Um, and well, so this is a way of characterizing our optical. Path. But as I told you, what we want to go for. Okay, so actually we want to place all that, not only and see the movement of the particles in water, but we want to see them in vacuum. And this is because then. Uh, actually, if you have your particle held in vacuum, uh, then 
it's so the only force so if it's at the electric particle the only force that it, it will see is is the force of 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 gravitation and the force of light which you can compensate okay so, you, so this is the thing that you know so in principle having particles in vacuum allows you to have uh, some kind of inertial sensors if you want or control or better control like like the uh, the, the kind of things that you can measure so this is this is our setup from from above uh, here is how it looks from one of the windows and if you look closely you will see that here you have one particle which is actually floating in the air just above our microscope objective okay so this is just a if you want a a, a single dust particle which we can capture with with light and held it there uh, for many hours and then we can we can do whatever we want with us with that particle in particular what we can do is measure the position as i showed you before and now when you decrease the pressure of the chamber of the vacuum chamber what you see is that those, that corner frequency that you that i showed you actually it becomes some resonances and this is because the particle is no longer being dissipated there's there's not being hit and then it starts oscillating and you see these three peaks because you have oscillations in x y and z directions again we can control the motion of the particle with our optical phone. Uh, yeah, and so you can see that this is in the hundreds of kilohertz regime, but we want to go further. We want to go to the megahertz regime, and also we want to achieve gigahertz rotations. We want to set that. The, we want to impart angular momentum to our particle, start rotating it, and rotate rotate it at very high uh, speeds. Okay, so going in that direction, then I'm um, reaching the end of, of my talk. So I just wanted to show you one of the latest results that, that actually Iker got. And this is, so if you remember, is, is, this, is, this is how we can control the shape of our light. And what we have discovered is actually, I told you that when you have small particles, they tend to go to the bright spot of the, of the beam or to the where the light is brighter. But what happens when the, the particle is, is big, or at least optically big, it happens that the particle starts going to the, it, it can go also to the center of the beam, okay? So to, to the dark spot of, of beams. Uh, so actually here, so this is this is an images of, of how our, our trapping beams look like. Um, and this is uh, images of, of what happens when you have a particle there, in there. And you can see, well, you can barely see it here, but you can see that actually the particle goes to the, to the center of the beam. Uh, and this changes the, like, in a cylindrically symmetric way, the, the, your, your scattered light. But if you go to very big beams, then the particle starts going to the, to the bright side of the, of the beam, and then it starts rotating. Okay. So what we can do now is we can control actually uh, <coughs> the force on our particle and how much light it goes into our, our, our optical trap. And also going from centered optical traps to off-center optical traps and start rotating the particle. But actually, this is very interesting because this, this opens another way of, of doing optical traps, not, not only uh, to control the optical forces, but also use them with fluorescence particles. Because what happens is that if you use an optical trap and you have a fluorescence, a fluorescence particle, usually what happens with the fluorescence is, is it's killed by the same optical trap that it's holding it, okay? And now what we can do is trap our particle and actually the, the, the dark part of the beam. Also, this is this is interesting because you can also start using biological samples, because actually, as the as the sum as the uh, as, as the cell or the bacteria is trapped in the dark part of the of the light of, of the beam, it's it's not affected by it's not so much affected by by the light beam. Uh, okay, so forget about that. This is this is how the optical forces look like, but I want to show you this. Uh, image because it shows you that so this is our spherical patterns the ones that, that are being trapped in these systems and you can see how actually when you use a gaussian beam light is concentrated inside the particle but when you trap it with with a Lagrange gaussian beam with one of those donut beams actually light is not so much concentrated in the particle but it's on the outskirts and these are still still stable stable traps so you are trapping your particle with very low light moreover um this is a measurement of the forces with that technique that I showed you of the, of the corner frequency. So this is um, how, how big our optical forces are with different beams. 
And you can see that actually when you are, we are using um, L equal one or L equal two, these are the ones which are these donut beams with one and two. So actually the optical process that we are doing are even bigger at the Gaussian beam. So actually for, for so this, this allows us a, a big control on, on, on our optical traps. And also it allows us to do physics, which was not possible before. Okay, so I'm finishing now. I've tried to cover uh, most of the topics that we do in, uh, in our lab, just to give you an idea and, and open our lab for discussions and possible collaborations. Um, the, 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 the idea in the end is to try to combine all these techniques in a single one uh, and try to do that. So use quantum emitters and charged particles in optical traps. Uh, now we can do it because we know we now uh, we now know that that the that we can trap particles with very low light. Okay, so we can trap let's say big particles in a spot where the, 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 there's there's uh, very little light. We want also to relate particles at high with h speeds, uh, and with all the techniques that we are developing with entangled photons and squeeze light, we want to measure those 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 uh, those uh, rotational speeds with with great accuracy. Okay, um, so coming back to the beginning of, of the talk, uh, I'm not sure if we will we will ever measure this uh, radiation reaction uh, 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 phenomena in our lab, but we would like to have a chance of measuring them. Okay, so this is at least what we want, and in the meantime, just do some cool physics. So thank you very much for your attention. Right. Thanks a lot, uh, Rafael, for uh, oh, this uh, great overview. Um, are there questions? Um, I wanted to ask about this optical trap. Uh, what's the name, uh, the limit of the size of the particles that you can trap there? Well, so we can go from very small particles, let's say nanometer sized particles, to five, seven microns and actually beyond. And actually, does it depend on the material of these particles? Yeah, so actually, that's why I told you that, that this, this works for big particles, but this is big optical sizes. Okay, so what we want to have, so what it's important here is the optical size. Let's say the, the multiplication of the actual size, the physical size times the index of refraction. So the bigger the index of refraction, the smaller the physical size of the particle can be. I have a related question. Uh, how small can you make your vortex? What is the minimum size of, of the vortex? Well, here you have less than one micron, let's say. Uh, this is, I mean, so it's for, for the visible. For eh? for yes, 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 yes. This is uh, 900 nanometers bigger. Mm, yes. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on intensity. Now, if you intensity goes to infinity, you can make it as small as you like. Mm. What? No. So I thought that you meant this the, this size. No, the, whole, the, 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 the size, the size of the whole, let's say, vortex field when it, the intensity decreases like half. Or... Yeah. So this this is this is a very deep level example. Okay. So we can go diffraction so the diffraction limited spots, and the thing is that because these are structure beams, so they they, they, they are not uh, Gaussian modes, then they are mm. a little bit bigger than a than a Gaussian mode could be. So this is with nine hundred nanometers, we can go to diameters of four hundred nanometers, let's say. Um, but if you make your your mode bigger, then it's something big. This is I mean, this is probably state of the art. I would say you cannot go much smaller than that. I mean, you can go a factor eighty uh, percent. Okay, thanks, Gabriel. When you are talking about uh, your wish to rotate particle, what do you exactly mean? It's uh, what kind of torch mode or spiraling mode or what? so we can do both as I so actually so I haven't shown you videos but if, so if you were interested in your has videos where actually these particles when they when they are trapped in this in this kind of high order beams they go to the ring and then they start rotating around the center but what we cannot we haven't been able to measure that now but I bet uh, everything says that actually the particles which are trapped here are rotating around their own axis okay? because the 
the beam is pushing them all around the and actually you can also use the polarization to rotate the particles in this. Uh, do you also work with charged particles? Oh. Not not yet. Not yet. Okay. This is this is in, in our wish list. So yeah. on the other hand, actually uh the, the MB centers in, in diamonds, they are they, they can be charged. So because you have two different kinds of, of MB states, one is neutral and the other is has a negative charge. But we haven't been able to measure this. Okay. Yeah, I, I made charge particles in these trappings. So. No, no, not yet. Yeah. <clears throat> in the first part, you talked about the entangled photons going mm -hmm. through the hole. And how do you control whether it's a singlet entangled state or like the triplet one? Or do they? Oh, yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's here. Okay. <clears throat> so actually, so the two photons go together. And when you use this half wave plate, changes the state of both photons at the same time. Okay. And depending on the position of the of the of the of, the, of this uh half wave plate, what you do is you change the phase between the two photons, between the two possibilities. Which is from the particles in the laser beam that are not spherical, like numbers. Yes. Or, or you're not doing that. No, definitely. We could. We haven't done that. I mean, this is this. I would say that that's the easy thing. Oh, okay. Really? Uh, I, I think he was asking about plasmonic particles. So, plasmonic, the problem with plasmonic particles is that is that they heat. Okay. So in, in, in that way, so you can do that easily in water. In vacuum, it's going to be more complicated because the, there's no dissipation of the heat. So probably the, the particle can, so we have to find a way of, of dissipating the heat without dissipating the motion of the particle. And that's not easy. Uh, can you trap two particles simultaneously yes. and then see how they interact the, this yes. oscillation. Actually, we did it. I showed you in the video that we were starting to do that by chance. Actually, we can we trapped many particles in the same trap. But then, can you observe the interaction of, of this? We, so you, you can see. So we can either image that with, with the image interviews that we have, or we can observe the the, the the combined motion of the two and then see what are the kind of resonances that we use. But I mean, it has been done in the literature. At some point, you mentioned that on the Dulicium, this quantum squeeze light. What, what do you mean with quantum for squeeze light? So, the, the idea is very similar to the one that I showed you, uh, where with entangled photons, that, that you create two photon states uh, so, uh, in, in your crystal. But instead of being two photons, it's like a superposition of having no photons, two photons, four photons, eight photons, 16 photons, and so on. Okay, so it's so the photons are created in pairs and with your with your crystal and, and uh, cavity, then what happens is that you can increase the power inside the crystal, and then you can make, create these kind of states where you have more than two photons. Okay? So that state, that that kind of states, when you have many many photons, they can be described with uh, like uh, in, in quantum optics, you you describe them with coherent like coherent states, okay, with the different quadratures. And what happens is that actually these kind of st states have the property that you can Decrease the noise in one of the quadratures and increase them while you are increasing. Them. And then you can make states which are, so I have some images if you want for other talks. But what you can do is make them more sensitive to phase or make them more sensitive to the photon number. And this, and this is the kind of states that we are developing in our work. Maria, Angel, Jason, they can, they can uh, help you understand. No more questions, but they have uh, one in the, uh -huh. in the chat. Um, I, I, saw, I don't know if you can ask it yourself, I saw, or if you, um, you can keep it. If we, I don't know, are you, I can also read it. Um, I saw. Echo? 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 
<laughs> okay, let me, let me read it. Um, uh, I have no permission yet. Okay, I don't know how to give him the permission. You have permission to read. Yes, so uh, hi, Gabriel. What's the minimum magnetic field you can measure with your MBC? Uh, Ruben is here. Maybe you can have me. Uh, so we were doing some, some um, calculations on that. Again, it depends on on so the, the right number to use there is not the magnetic field, field per se, but actually the magnetic field the magnetic field divided by the, the square root of hertz. Okay, so this is so it really depends on how much time you allow for the measurements to take. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we were going to nano Teslas, mm -hmm. but uh, I will I will I will check that. Okay, <clears throat> so thank you. I don't see more questions. Then we can continue to discuss uh, at, the, at the refreshments over in the kitchen. And let's thank Gabriel again. Thank you. if you pump it harder, what happens is that you are you are increasing the intensity, yes, yes, and then you are depleting the presence. True, okay. true, but isn't this also doesn't it mean that there is um, there will be an optical field present? So, so you showed you showed um, showed these rings with a dark spot in the center because intensity was very low there. As you increase the intensity, the you, you will uh, so then as you the, the Thing that was dark will become brighter. No, no. So what what happens is that if you increase the intensity, the, no. the dark spot keeps being dark. But imagine that you have a, a camera which mm -hmm. it saturates. Okay. Yes. What you would see is that you will saturate the camera, and the dark spot could become narrower and narrower. Yes, but why do you? So that's what I'm. What I was thinking. So if okay, if I'm if I'm <clears throat> so. Let's say if you, if you would be able to detect how much photons are there um, at a given point, then you would uh, always see zero photons right at the center. But as you move away from it, you will get you will see a number of photons that is um, yeah. more, and that increases as you increase the intensity of the of the overall field. Right, and so so then. But okay. this doesn't make the, your your tunnel small. What it makes is that the, the dark the part place yeah, yes the a hole gets small no right. the hole i mean so okay if you say if you say i call it a hole if there are less than n photons yes. per second then, then it gets small okay okay but but and, and isn't i thought this was what would uh, cause sort of um a trapping so as you try to is your particle um that is yeah but that kind uh, of yeah no 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 in our case it's it's not it's it's mm -hmm. completely so so that is a nonlinear effect Okay, so the thing that you're mentioning, you're mm -hmm. mentioning the statics and on mirror, where you are saturating your mm -hmm. your yeah. sample, and then oh yes, I, I I mean I agree that the step has to do with that you are pumping a nonlinear emitter, and and so it can no longer emit. But okay, but and maybe my I I just thought that the this intensity that these plots show um is related to the to the dipole force that the particle feels, and so as as it tries to move from the center away, it's, it's how strong the force is will depend on the intensity. It's more complicated. So what happens with those donut pins is that you completely kill the dipole force. And then you go, so you allow for multipolar, um, mm -hmm. multipolar forces. But, uh, and, and these forces are not intensity dependent? They are intensity, they are intensity dependent, but what happens is that because you kill the dipole mm -hmm. force, which is typically the dominant one, mm -hmm. then the others are more stable when they are in. Mm -hmm. okay. okay but 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 where you where is sort of your um so, so that steepness of the trap doesn't depend on the intensity 
It depends on the intensity, it, but once, that, that was yeah. the, the okay. Uh, okay, so that means at high intensity, yeah. it's a steeper yes. trap and you sure. confine more. Okay, yes. okay. Uh, just that I don't have a misconception. I, I, I have a couple of questions, but maybe they are a little bit naive, and I didn't want them to. Ah, one of them. Ah, see. 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 Um, if you want to say the, okay. I did it, it's 